In our last session, we saw that models can be helpful for making our designs visible and accessible for all. They improve the quality of communication and keep us aligned during our design process. Models are inherently limited in how they represent their subjects. They are useful to the extent that their limitations match their purposes. Models that are fine for one purpose may be unsuitable for another. Systems engineering requires the use of models that allow us to see the structure, relationships, elements, and results of the system that we are considering. Other models, while they may be useful, are not the basis of MBSE. In this session, we will address some of the challenges and pitfalls that face the systems engineer in a design project. In particular, we will address the kinds and characteristics of complexity, one of the biggest challenges facing system designers today. There are two different ways of thinking about systems. Both are important and useful in the proper context. The first is known as analytic thinking. A theme of the Western Enlightenment, this way of thinking is well understood as an approach to problem solving. It is taught as the primary way of thinking about problems in our educational system. Analytic thinking gained momentum from the shift in thinking that occurred in the scientific world at the end of the Middle Ages and found flower in the Enlightenment. In the 1500s, Nicholas Copernicus used his observations of the movement of the planets in our solar system to posit a new model of the heavens. His model was heliocentric, rejecting the spherical Ptolemaic model with the Earth at its center. This is significant to our discussion because it kicked off a series of advances which led to explaining the motion of the heavenly bodies across the sky using mathematical formula. Soon the discovery of principles behind the operation of other areas of science, like the work of Harvey in explaining the human circulatory system, led to a generalization regarding the mechanics of nature. Rather than the more mystical view of classical science, the universe came to be seen as mechanistic, governed by rules and laws that could be discovered and understood. This view was also deterministic in nature. If one could discover all of the relevant information regarding the state of the system and couple that with an understanding of all the rules governing the operation of that system, one could accurately predict the future state of the system. The quest for this knowledge of the state of systems and the rules governing them took the form of analysis, the attempt to understand something by first understanding the operation of its constituent parts. As the machine outlook on systems emerged in the 16th and 17th centuries, analytic thinking, or analysis, began to predominate. Using the machine view of systems, Enlightenment thinkers saw system results as a chain of cause and effect actions following a finite set of determinate rules. Understanding a system in this context became a process of breaking it down into its component parts, understanding the action of the parts and the rules that govern them, and then aggregating that knowledge back up to the system level to understand the system. This process of breaking apart systems, analysis, in order to understand them became the rule of the day for the Enlightenment. The reductionist approach became the norm. Analytic thinking is particularly good at understanding complicated problems, problems involving a high level of detail but operating in deterministic ways. The clockworks pictured here is a good example. Despite the number of gears and interactions, the system functions deterministically. A given rotation of any one gear will translate into a given rotation in any other. All we need to know to predict their rotations is the diameter and position of each gear. This is a complicated system, 
and analytics works fine here. There is a cautionary note about this approach. While analysis is a valuable tool and certainly has its place in the thinking toolbox, it has a definite downside. The notable systems thinker Russell Acoff warned, analytic thinking applies an analytic method to separate a system down into its constituent parts. Analytic thinking attempts to explain the behavior of these parts and then attempts to aggregate this understanding into an understanding of the whole. This approach cannot succeed, for when a system is taken apart, it loses all its essential characteristics, and so do its parts. A disassembled automobile cannot transport anyone, and the motor taken out of it cannot move anything, even itself. As Peter Senge put it in the fifth discipline, Dividing an elephant in half does not produce two elephants. Likewise, looking at half an elephant does not allow us to observe the complete functioning elephant. Looking at parts obscures the emergent results and behaviors. Fortunately, the advent of systems thinking has brought with it a kind of thinking that can take us where no analyst has dared to go. This thinking is called synthetic. An important part of the work of such system thinkers as Ludwig von Burton Laffey, Wes Churchman, Russell Acoff, and Peter Senge, this thinking allows us to engage systems as systems rather than as aggregated parts. Using synthetic thinking, we can see the properties and results that emerge in the system. That is not possible at the analytic or parts level. According to Acoff, systemic thinking is holistic versus reductionist thinking, synthetic versus analytic. Reductionist and analytic thinking derives properties of whole from the properties of their parts. Holistic and synthetic thinking derives properties of parts from the properties of the whole that contains them. But we have transcended the merely complicated problems amenable to analytic understanding. We face complex and often wicked problems. The term wicked problem is a term of art for a problem that resists solution, exhibits incomplete, contradictory, and changing requirements, and has no stopping rule or a way to know when the solution is reached. The world is characterized by complexity and change. Our problems are more than just complicated. Problems that have many elements but are driven by linear cause and effect relationships. They are complex at the detail level and across time. The ability to deal with systems synthetically is important and its importance is magnified when dealing with complexity. The only hope for confronting and understanding complexity is through the use of synthetic thinking. The kind of complexity that results from systems and large, with large numbers of elements linked together in many and varied ways is called detail complexity. Understanding this kind of complexity calls for facing the challenge of enumerating, cataloging, and understanding this complex web of elements and relationships. The principles embodied in the systems definition still apply but they can become difficult to keep in focus because of the sheer volume of detail. Detail complexity opens the door to a wide variety of potential systems changes. With many more elements and relationships, there are many more possibilities for changes to the structure and the makeup of the system. From what we know of emergence, we can predict that this results in a corresponding expansion of the possible system results. The greater the complexity, the greater the possibilities, wanted and unwanted. We also find that the problems and solutions can become complex due to the ways in which they change over time. Especially in the face of a large number of elements and relationships, these changes can become extremely hard to track predict, and account for. Such complexity is known as dynamic complexity. 
Detail complexity and dynamic complexity often occur together, thus magnifying their effects. Unfortunately, the complexity monster has more faces as well. The systems that exist in this complex world can be physically complex systems where actions or conditions produce different system states according to the non-deterministic applications of laws and or complex adaptive systems where change and response produce adaptive or learning systems behaviors. In any case, these systems, problems, and solutions are too complex to be grasped by mere observation. A disciplined, comprehensive approach must be available to provide a framework for preserving and manipulating the observations. In a complex physical system, rules or laws, often expressed as differential equations, control the shifting of the system from one state to another. A chess game is a good example of a complex physical system. Every change in state, in other words, a new position on the board, is governed by the application of one or more rules of movement, but it is not deterministic in the manner of a complicated machine. The chess game transitions from state to state as controlled by a thinking entity, the player, who makes choices within those rules. Complex adaptive systems are composed of elements called agents that adjust their behavior or learn from the experience of interacting with their environment. Economic and weather systems are examples of complex adaptive systems whose behavior is altered based on what goes on in the environment. They are even less predictable or arguably more complex than the physical systems. Complex physical or adaptive systems can have lots of elements interacting with each other in their environment in a myriad of ways. This detail complexity is compounded by changing interactions over time of dynamic complexity. Real understanding requires some way to organize and represent all this. With complexity, detail and dynamic, physical and adaptive, to blur or obscure the view the challenge is significant. Clearly, the engineer cannot rely on memory and ad hoc mental processes to create the comprehensive understanding that is required. There must be some way to instantiate and make visible the systems that contain the problems and solutions. This is where models come into play. The road to successful systems engineering is not without pitfalls. Most often, these take the form of thinking traps, where enticing misconceptions lure the systems engineer away from sound practice. There is a portion of the systems engineering discipline that is accustomed to working with equation-based physical models. Sometimes, these folks are skip skeptical of models which are not equation-based and or believe that the familiar equation-based models are the kinds of models that can serve as models for model-based systems engineering. Both of these points of view create a pitfall for the systems engineer. In the first instance, there is nothing inherently invalid about a process model constructed from language based on descriptions of process flows. Such models have a well-developed history of use and have been the subject of standards work, including the original 1947 American Society of Mechanical Engineers standard for process flow models, like the one depicted here. For the purposes of systems engineering, it is the logical architecture or process flows of a system that are the subject of the foundational models. While the equation-based performance models can provide valuable information for the engineering effort, they are not the models that make systems engineering model-based. Another attractive misconception that is fairly widespread among systems engineers holds that a robust collection of views considered in the aggregate 
are a model for the purpose of model-based systems engineering. This is, however, not the case. Unless the views are connected through a database model, they do not hold the elements in relationship to each other and do not provide the necessary systems view. We can understand this by considering the nature of a view. A view is simply a structured answer to a query of the database for a subset of the information contained in the database to be returned in the format defined for that view. In order to produce a view, there must be a database to query. Most often, even for collections of views, the database resides in the head of the designer. This returns us again to the problem of models which are simply a mental picture of the design. Yet another pitfall is contained in the suggestion that the modeling tool or, and or its modeling language should be made more accessible by the radical simplification of the structure of the language. Typically this does achieve the goal of accessibility. However, it does so at the expense of the robustness of the model. A simple example would be to consider the language of our old Dick and Jane readers. This language is highly accessible and easy to use. However, it's nearly useless to describe any sort of complex subject. If you have one dog and his name is Spot and all he does is run, an oversimplified language will do just fine. But if Spot needs to go to the veterinarian for some medical treatment, the language will be nearly useless to describe the trip, the office, or the procedure. As Einstein said, everything should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. We have seen the challenge of complexity and the dangers of analysis without synthesis. The pitfalls of thinking that equation-based models are the only reliable models, that a set of views can be a model, or that a simpler language is a better language, challenge our efforts. Being aware of these is the first step to avoiding them. In our next session, we will look at four fundamental concepts of model-based systems engineering. Until then, be well.